for our guest, everybody, since Jesus has given us a simple and profound formula for getting our requests and prayer. I was thinking and meditating about some of those that could not be here. I thought about Superintendent Jones. I thought about Sister Lee, who has been touched with an affliction. We just can't be real saved and shout all the time without thinking of somebody else. And uh, I want you to put your hand on somebody else today while we make intercession. This has been a meeting of intercession. God has been breaking rules. Breaking rules. And uh, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Shackles and hindering causes. Evil satanic powers. Evil forces that come against the saints. Strongholds of the devil. That wage war and assault the saints. Pastors, superintendents, elders. You don't get them about your position. Because he jumped on Jesus. Even in his weakest moment. Been fasting for 40 days. So this is a good time to get him. Because he's kind of weak now. He got him in a very sneaky way. He said, if you be the son of God. And he came with insinuation. The devil will try to sneak upon you with insinuation. If you be the son of God, it wouldn't be any harm. I know you're hungry, you've been fasting for 40 days. Common sense tells you you're hungry. And what harm would it be to make a few rock biscuits? Jesus had the word now. Saints who are not built on the word and on a lot of the noise and sound, fantastic stories, things and tales will not be able to stand in these days. But when you have been grounded on the truth, the truth will make you free. These are deceitful days. These are days that's very deceptive. And they're more subtle than those of our parents. We talk about what they went through and keep harping on that. But they didn't go through what you got to go through. Being hungry and being naked is not near as bad as this what the devil's doing now. You can be dressed up. Never don't care about you being dressed up. I don't keep the devil from bothering you because you're dressed up. You can be dressed up with a broken heart. And he's out there to make inroads on the church. And he's watching every vulnerable spot, every weak point. And that's why the saints ought to get together. You ought to close ranks on the devil. The Bible said, don't give place to the devil. If you make room for him, he'll come in. But we're going to close him out today. There's enough of us here today to shut him out. Hey. Hallelujah. He has given us power. And the word power means authority. We have authority over the devil to cast him out. Jesus called his 10 and his 12 disciples and said, I give you power over unclean spirits to cast him out. And to cleanse the lepers, to heal the sick, and even raise the dead. We've got the authority. And the devil knows it. And we can dampen our mind and play our spirits. Give us that sense of doubt. He'll keep us from doing what God said to us. So Jesus said, not only what I've done, but greater than these. We have the authority today to find the devil. How many believe that? Well, we're going to cast him out today. Hallelujah. Cancel. Crack. I don't think we ought to back up off a crack. I'm sick and tired of cancer, too. I think we ought to weather the war against cancer. Hey, hey. That's a good in my home. I know what devastation it leaves. I know many heartaches, and I know how lonely it leaves you. And we're going to have to rise up against cancer. It's a curse. 
I mean, God can turn the tide. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands up against the devil. Satan. Let's talk to him. Call him by his name. Satan. The Lord rebuke you. In the name of Jesus. We cast you out.
get them saved when you're a young lady. And they, they got out of the business. And we've been taking it. I don't know how many young men we've been taking them lately. They get them saved. You want them once you're about to marry, get them saved. You hold up your light and keep your marbles and keep your steps straight. You can draw them. But when they can draw you, they'll they stay out there and pick you up. That's what they want. They want some nice, clean young ladies. They come in and trip you out and run on back, but you let them know that this, you can go so far and then stop here, come on back. But you've got to hold up the light. Sometimes it's your fault. Amen. Don't make men so important and so popular. I don't care whose son they are. Put him in his place. Amen. Let him know that I don't give you our Bishop Watson's son. Amen. I'm sanctified. Amen. We don't do things like that. Stand for something. Amen. And I, I appreciate it. God will bless you with somebody down the road. My son's going here. Uh, my daughter, she's going to get eaten for me for battling, and she went out and married her somebody. <laughs> Wouldn't tell me nothing. Got married on the same day that I had got married. He wouldn't say nothing, but I came back. He came out, he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to, how to get it out and how to tell it. Uh, Mr. Uh, he want to talk with you. I said, well, what is it? I was very uh, dull and droll. I said, what do you want to say? He couldn't hardly say it. I said, where you all going to stay? <laughs> he didn't say much, but wherever he said, he's still there. <laughs> he had a slight stroke. Amen. But so, so what? I think everybody ought to have some type of and as you grow up, the mission department uh, tomorrow is fasting. My wife, she's on a 30 day consecration. Just water. Several of the saints. That was after he's been on the water consecration. There's nothing but liquids. Whatever you do for the law, it will pay it. It will pay off. Give up one meal, give up all the meals. If it goes to your credit, God will register it on your account. And in these days, we need to make some type of commitment to the Lord so that God can turn the tide in these evil days. I don't think I have ever seen a day like this. I've been in the Church of God in Christ all my life. I've been preaching 65 years. I've been going to Memphis since 1927. I have missed but once since 1927. I was I had an accident that year and stayed away. But as a boy, up until this present time, and I have never in all my life seen times, situations, and conditions, both home or religiously, socially, politically, any way you want to look at it like the times in which we face. And we're the only ones that have the key to it. We're the only ones that can help save the city, save the world. We have the real the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. People make light of preachers. They don't really see their relevance to these times. But God has always, in the time of crisis, he didn't call the politicians. He always called the preachers. Call the preacher is deprecated by many in the secular world. Mr. Criswell, uh, Dr. Criswell, in pastor of the largest Baptist church in America, in Dallas, Texas. He said when he gave his life to be a preacher, the remark was made to him, what a pity to throw your life away. 
judgment of so much of the unbelieving world is that the influence of the pulpit uh, has long been rejected by the thinking people. And that uh, the minister of the pulpit is irrelevant and insignificant. A lot of people don't, don't think it's really a place for the preacher in this 20th century, in this 21st century. And that he's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. And sometimes the way we act and the way we take seriously what he says, the attitude of the people in the church adds credence to what the people think. I don't know whether many of the people in the church are really conscious of the mysterious responsibility, the amazing task that the pastor has. I have to study it myself to keep from becoming disheartened and disillusioned. Because there's not a pastor out there or up here or anywhere that whatever task he's facing has any security. His only security is in his faith in God, and in his commitment to his task and his faith in what God has called him to do. He's mandated to do it, and everyone that has been called to these tasks have always uh, retreated from it and pulled back in a sense of reluctance because they were conscious that the task was something that was beyond our physical, mental, or uh, whatever ability that is required to fulfill it beyond our task, beyond our ability. Moses didn't want to go. He gave his reasons. He had an impediment of speech. Jeremiah really was reluctant and pulled back. And all of those who were called for this tremendous task and felt the sense of uh, inadequacy, Paul said it like this as he looked at it after he got into it. Who is sufficient for these things? Yes, I look at it myself now, and when I face the fact that uh, the people come to me for so many answers and so many problems, and so many things that they look to the past from this day, just this day, I've had to sit down and speak to people and help them on all that. And they seem to think that you can help them, I don't care what it is. If it's, if it's foreclosure, if it's buying a new car, if it's a baby going to be born, whatever it is, they seem to think we ought to know something. And many of them don't even pray for you that God will give you the wisdom. They just expect you to be able to answer the problem. And so Paul said, who is sufficient for these men? Who can do what he has been commissioned to do by the call of God? We've been called to raise the dead and to give sight to the blind and to make saints out of sinners. We've been called to feed the multitude with nothing but a lunch. That's not enough for our sin. And then Paul answered his own question. He said, but our sufficiency is of God who gives us strength in the new covenant to supply us with the sufficiency to meet the demands, the questions, the drives, uh, the longings, the vacuums, and the unanswered questions of this day, of the sisterhoods and problems of stress and strain. And many of the pastors are disillusioned and discouraged, disturbed, distracted. Some folks think you should never be discouraged. You think you ought to have the appetite of a canary and the strength of a mule. Wow. You think you ought to live on earth and bold in heaven. Wow. And they think that he ought to be Superman without any complaints. You ought to never whine or complain about anything. And yet they don't pray for him or undergird him to meet these problems of life. I want that man the pastor to persuade himself that he will escape, he cannot escape these days as he goes to the university of hard knocks and troubles. Yes. Every one of us got to go to that university. Right. And we got to major in the problems of unanswered questions. We got to be led into the unknown and into the mystiques of life. And we wonder sometimes why did God leave me in that way. I'm going to talk on the subject today that I tried to evade, but it seems to keep 
lingering on my mind, and it may help somebody today. It's in the seventh chapter of Romans. I guess practically all of the Christians in one way or another will read the seventh chapter of Romans. And it's been a question in our mind as to when was that in the life of Paul? When did he live in that particular chapter? I'm going to start reading at the 8th verse of the 7th chapter. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, how to perform that which is good, I find none. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Let everybody repeat after me. But I see another law in my memory, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my memories. God bless you. Then he goes further by saying, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. I want to talk from this subject today, the dual nature and the dual within. The dual nature. Everybody said the dual nature and the dual within. Now that's a strange paradox, but it's the true epitome and the true exposition of the life of a Christian. Before you become a Christian, you're just one person. You have no trouble because you're not pleased nobody but the devil. But when you become a change in your masters, transfer your allegiance to Christ, then you uh, become two people. And you've got a problem on your hand. Uh, I question whether any man understands himself, and I'm quite certain that no Christian does so. The great is the mystery of godliness. In more cases than one, the believer is a great riddle to those who observe him. He is discerned of no man. He is equal in enigma to himself. The frequency of books like Benning's Orthodox Paradoxes, the believer's riddle, is not at all wonderful, for a thousand riddles may be made about the Christian. And since he is a paradox from beginning to end, uh, then as Plato used to say of each man that he was two men in one. So may we with emphasis say of each Christian that uh, two men is in one, oftentimes to himself. The evil man within him appears to be the uppermost. And yet, by the grace of God, it never can be. For the ultimate victory belongs to the new and spiritual life which becomes possible by a regeneration through the Spirit of God. We see in every Christian what was seen in the Shunammite in the song as it were the company of two armies. This is not always known by the believer when he commences the new life. He starts knowing that he is a sinner and that Jesus is his Savior. But as he proceeds, he finds that he is more of a sinner than he thought he was. And many surprises await him, and some things which, if he be not prepared for them, will stagger him as though some strange thing had happened to him. Perhaps my discourse on this subject may prevent some of the new converts and new saints from being overwhelmed with this unexpected storm. A lot of folks get surprised when they get saved because they think that trouble's over with. Uh -huh. They own lovers name and they got clear sailing for him. Uh -huh. Like some of them didn't you got married. You got married to get out of trouble. Uh -huh. And 
Did I sick and tired of being uh, bombarded with questions and inquiries? What time did you get in and all that? So I'm going to get married where I'll be free from questions. And you find out that you jumped out the frying pan in the fireplace. And so a lot of people thought when they got saved and they got sanctified and full of the Holy Ghost that they were going to shout the victory from here to heaven. But uh, when they found out that instead of being free from uh, frustrations and fear, the fight just begun. Say amen. And so we want to help you solve the question which will arise in your mind. If I was a child of God, would all this happen to me? And okay, I say as you are, you cannot prevent these conflicts of life, these unexpected vicissitudes and blows of life that come with a sudden thrust catch you by surprise. Our first head will be there are in all believers two principles. The apostle speaks of the law of his mind. Then of another law in his members warring against the law of his mind. The converted man is a new man in Christ Jesus, but the old nature remains within him. The first life in a Christian in order of time is the old Adam, Adamic nature. It is there from the first, it's born of and with the flesh, and it remains in us after we are born of the Spirit. For the second birth does not destroy in us the products of the first birth. Regeneration brings into us a new and higher principle, which is ultimately to destroy the sinful nature. But the old principle still remains and labors to retain its power. Well, some fancy that the car line is to be improved and gradually tamed down and sanctified. But I want you to know that it's enmity against God and it cannot be separate to God and neither indeed can be. I don't care how much Holy Ghost you get, you can't tame your flesh. It's still the flesh and it's still set. And if you don't keep it under the proper control, it'll break loose again. Amen. You cannot improve the flesh. I don't care how you instruct it. You can take it from the gutter and put it in the choir, but it's still the flesh. If you don't bring it in that regenerated form and put that new principle of God in there to subdue it and console it, for the old nature lives in our members. That is to say, its nest is in the body. And it works through the body. There are certain appetites of ours which are perfectly allowable and they, uh, they're even necessary to existence. All right. uh, but they can be very easily pushed to sinful extremes. Yeah. Then that which is lawful and right becomes a mess, but that which is unlawful and wrong. Right. It is a commendable thing that a man should seek to provide for his family, right. but he can be so motivated by that urge until he will seek and do wrong trying to provide for his family. Right. Man has an appetite, but he got to watch how he lets it control him. Religion is a controlling power. It doesn't say, and this is one thing that we've got to learn, and many people are kept out of the church because they do not realize that religion does not deprive you of none of the things that you ought to have. It doesn't take your nature from you. It doesn't stop you from being sexy. It doesn't take your temper from you. But it gives you power of control. How to regulate and equate and keep it subdued under subjection. I bring myself under subjection. And I hear Paul say, let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lust that are wrong. And you, you're in bad shape, but you're going to let your emotions and your appetites and your passions run wild. And let them make, make you do what you know you shouldn't do. You are going to be the... Uh, you're going to be ultimately ruined and disgraced because of your lack of control. Say amen. Man may eat and drink, yet it is through the appetite that a thousand sins are engendered. Man, when he is in his right condition, puts a bit into the mouth of his desires, holds it in as with a bit in a bridle. His higher nature governs his bodily appetite, not without great effort. And that's all. David said, I said, I'll take heed to my way, that I sin not with my tongue. I'll keep my mouth with a brag. 
where the wicked is before. And that's what many saints in the church unbridled without any government. They forget that the life of the spirit is a lawful life that must be covered on certain lawful principles. When you transgress those laws, you reap the repercussions of your transgression. Oh, boy. I've heard of some professors who dream that sin is utterly destroyed in them and that they have no more evil tendencies and desires, but I shall not come to break that notion. I've seen some perfect folks in the church, but I've watched them. I'm, I, I, I don't, I, they, 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 they don't fool me anymore. I watch the perfect folks who don't ever do nothing wrong. And when I follow them real close, they're the worst folks in the church. You can't deal with them. You can't talk to them. You can't read with them. They know everything. You can't, you can't help them. They won't improve because they've got everything under control. They are touchy. They're sensitive. And some of them have turned out to be such detestable hypocrites that I rather pray of persons who have no imperfections at all. See, that like Jesus. He seemed to deal with reject people who've been turned down, folks that society don't want. Jesus seemed to give them a chance. Yes, and that's what the church is all about. Church is not in here to criticize and find fault. Preaching will never build the church if you just stop there finding fault. But you've got to rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. What is the church you and that you, you when, when you are not saved, you're ready to be saved. That's the only thing that gets you ready to be saved. You don't have to get dirty clothes ready to go to the laundry. The fact that they're dirty makes them ready. When your life is not in shape, you're ready to be saved. Jesus said, come for all things are now ready. Yes, well, praise the Lord. And my friends, as soon as I learn about these folks that's supposed to be perfect, they, they disappoint me. They come up with something that shatters my confidence. So I'd rather trust people who made mistakes, yes, who slipped and fell, and come back again. I like Peter because he, he, he's rash and he's outspoken, but he will repent and get straight. I like David because he did do wrong. But I hear him say, I acknowledge my sin and my transgressions are ever before me. Now Solomon was a wiser man than lived, but he played the fool. I don't know, I've never heard anybody yet, Dr. Stallworth, that want to be like Solomon. Even though he was a claim the wildest man, he played the fool. He tried to cover all his mistakes and sins with scribes and all types of things to camouflage. And you can't camouflage with God. You've got to come to the open heart. Nothing in my hand I bring. Slip to do the cross I turn. You have to try to justify yourself. You have to try to clean up yourself. But just as I am. Oh, 
yourself. You've got to be serious about this. I, I found out in my own self. The only way I'm going to get the victory is if you can't get the daddy with sin. You can't try to chide yourself. And we've been trying to make excuses for it. And you don't know how powerful sin is nowhere until you expose it. You, you, you think it's uh, covered up and you think it's hidden, but when you try to uncover it, when you try to get loose from it, you'll find what a hold it's got. You'll find out how deep it is. You'll find out that you've got to suffer. And there's many of the people in the church who don't ever get rid of sin. And they bring it all into the body. But he said, do we with the old man and his deed. Get rid of the whole man. Come out all of it. We inside every week. And the sin that does so easy to stretch. And then you put up the roof. You don't need to top in the tree and cutting off the branches. You got to get the root up. And when you get the root up, you won't have no trouble no more. When we're born, uh, and if there is drop in our soul, the living incorruptible seed, what's what is born of God, overcomes the world. That's the reason joining the church won't do it. And the boy down in Jesus' name will do it. There's no need to let people jive you. You have no need to be near the baptismal pool if you've never been born again. You're not entitled to the law. You're not entitled to be bound in Jesus' name and nobody else's name until you've dealt with your sin 